In our gospel lesson, which we have just heard read, there is a rather interesting and I suppose to be way to trip someone up. You know when we sometimes receive a whole string of compliments, then the zinger comes in and they put us in our place. They might do that, we might have done that to another person and maybe we have had it done to ourselves. Sometimes you kind of got to be careful when people are saying all kinds of good things about you because there may be some malice in all of that setting you up just to tell you how they really feel. So it is with our gospel lesson today. And uh, it begins by telling us how it really is. The Pharisees have set out to entrap Jesus in what he was saying. So they sent their disciples, namely the Pharisees' disciples, along with the Herodians, a group of very zealous Jews, saying, and here's the complimentary entrance, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, wow, okay, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. They are buttering him up, I would say. Yes, slathering it on rather deep. And then it says, tell us then what you think. Aha, here we are. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus was aware of their malice. He didn't pull anything over on Jesus, and so he gives them an example and asks them for a denarius, and he says to them, you know, whose head is on this denarius? And they said, well, obviously Caesar. And so then Jesus comes up with a statement that render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Kind of problematic for us and for them. A professor from University College of London has written on personality and leadership. It reflects, I've got this because it reflects upon these Pharisaic leaders. He claims the number one trait incompetent leaders possess is arrogance. The Pharisees thought they could trap him. He states an arrogant leader is a toxic leader. He put together a simple 10 question quiz to measure a leader's level of arrogance. Here are three of the questions that he asks. Do you have a special gift for playing office politics? Do you have a special gift there? Oh, ha. Huh. Are you blessed with natural charisma? Wow. Yeah, of course I am, right? Are you just too talented to fake humility? Yes. So we kind of have a setup here that this professor from London gives us, kind of like the setup that the Pharisees gave to Jesus, which leads to our gospel lesson, as I've just said. Jesus was wanted by the Pharisees to be shown as an incompetent leader. They wanted to trip him up, make him less popular in the eyes of the people. So they asked him loaded, a loaded question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? The Pharisees looked upon this as a no-win situation. Whichever way Jesus answered, he was going to make somebody unhappy and upset. Zealous Jews believed paying taxes to Rome was not only a burden to them, but it was a dishonoring God, because it was God to whom they owed their ultimate allegiance. And Caesar was declared on there as being divine. He was a, he was a competing God. If Jesus wanted to make himself popular with the Jewish people, he had only to say that it was against God's law to pay taxes to Caesar. However, if he advocated publicly against paying taxes, he would get into a heap of trouble with the Roman authorities and the government. He'd get in hot water. They would be tax evaders. While the Pharisees didn't really care about Jesus' opinion on taxes, they just used that as a front-end front end loaded question, they only cared about ruining his popularity with the people. Jesus didn't care about his popularity, however. He cared only about doing the work of his father. Jesus didn't have to struggle with that answer. 
at the root of the gospel lesson, as we begin to hear it, we must acknowledge, and we do acknowledge, that all belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Nothing belongs to Caesar. And he said, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. Well, it's all God's. If you want an answer unpopular with everyone, this is it. Some people resent paying taxes. Some people resent giving to God. Jesus wasn't trying to pile extra anxiety on those Jewish people. But Jesus is teaching us important principles. Interestingly enough, the dichotomy here is very clear, as it is in our own lives and always has been. The distinction between church and state, we work on that for probably over 3,000 years to get it kind of worked out, but it never really gets itself worked out. And so we have here this dichotomy, and Paul brings it up in his in his letters to the Christian churches about their obedience to the government, and he states very much clearly, like, like Jesus is stating here, we do have an allegiance to our government to be responsible to those who are in authority over us, but we also have an allegiance to God who provides all that we have. And we have to keep that in some sort of a balance the balance, of course, from our perspective, going in the direction of all is God's. So, why give? Well, there are numerous reasons for our giving, whether it be through our local church, its benevolences, its ministries, to the charities of the community, to the charities of the state and the nation and the world, to see that we are a part of a worldwide community of those who have the ability, the desire, and the blessing of giving. First, giving is the ultimate sign that we trust God. If we want to know what we believe about God, it has been said by some, just examine our checkbooks. Is our giving toward the work of God, and not only the church, but in other kinds of benevolent charities, does it match our level of how much we trust in God? Do we trust God enough to give a portion of what God has already given us to do the work of God? A couple named Jerry and Muriel Cavan have started numerous successful businesses over the years. As they reached retirement age, they realized that accumulating wealth was not what life was all about. They believed God was leading them to participate in a new venture. That venture was overseas Christian missions. Instead of protecting their retirement savings and all their investments that they'd accumulated, the Cavins decided to give away larger and larger portions of what they had amassed and of their income and investments to the work of God. Jerry Cavan says their generosity was stoked by the realization God was the true owner anyway of all they had. Once we understood we were giving away not our money, but God's money to do God's work, we had peace and we had joy. We never had more than that ever before until we began to understand that it is not our bank account it is not our money. It is not our stocks and bonds. Trust God leads to greater peace and joy. Trust God enough to give it away. The path to joy lies in sharing with God in the work of God's kingdom. Giving to the work of God gives us meaning and gives us purpose. Giving gives us meaning and purpose. You know, I believe that one of the joys, if not the greatest joy of Christmas, of course, is that Jesus gave his only begotten son for us, but that we can give to others. If we had 12 packages under the Christmas tree that were left on the 26th of December that we didn't give away, that would not make us very happy. We had to just take them back and give them to ourselves. But the giving even of gifts to family and friends and neighbors 
and others gives us great joy. It is the joy of giving, for it is really a joyful heart, a joyful life that gives. Secondly, giving to God's work is the ultimate opportunity we have to impact the world. Giving to God's work. Pastor W.A. Criswell, pastor of a mega church, tells the story of a man who asked, what did you do yesterday? Who was asked, what did you do yesterday? The man said, yesterday he taught a class in a church college. On Tuesday he was down in the Rio Grande Valley working in a vacation Bible school. On Wednesday he was operating in a church hospital in Nigeria. On Thursday he was teaching the word of God in the Amazon jungle. On Friday he was building a church house in the Philippines. On Saturday he was preaching in Tokyo. The friend stops him there and says, Man, even in this jet age, you can never get around like that. The fellow said, but I do it every day. I give to the church and to the mission, and it goes all over the earth, doing good for God's children. When we give to neighbors in need and run great out of sharing, our Christian world mission of OCWM, when we give to our food pantries in Washington County and beyond, when we give we impact the lives of people we do not even know beyond where we even are. It is extraordinary how just we ourselves in this small community can impact the entire world and have something as a presence of God everywhere. When we give to this bucket brigade, we're giving to families that we do not even know that were our neighbors who are in need. When we give to our neighbors in need offering, we're giving to people in this nation that we do not know. When we give to one great out of sharing during the Lenten season, we give all over. When we give to our church's wider mission, we give to people, and we are impacting people in Nigeria, in Asia. We're impacting people in St. Louis and in Washington County. We may never go to Haiti to feed a starving child. We may never dig a well in Honduras. We may never provide after-school activities to needy kids in St. Louis. But we bring gifts to all of them. We bring the good news of Jesus. Through our giving, we do all things and more. Our money fuels ministries saving lives, ministries changing lives. We are in a ministry all over the world. We bring hope and resources and life salvation. In Jesus' name, because we trust God first of all, and we trust God second enough to give. In 2011, former University of Georgia football coach Mark Richt and his wife, Catherine, sold their eight-bedroom mansion, which was worth almost $2 million. He sold numbers, a lot of their investments, so they could give more time and money to charities. Mark and Catherine had been reading the book, The Hole in Our Gospel, the H-O-L-E in Our Gospel, by Richard Stearns. Richard Stearns, you may not know, but he is a well-known Christian benevolent leader. He's the president of an organization called World Vision, a wonderful, wonderful mission of the church, World Vision. The book created in them a passion to contribute to international missions. Mark Richt said, you know what? I don't want to pour money into a home like that. I just make more money on the stock market when I can use it for better things, for things that are eternal. We may not have a $2 million house, we may not have a $12 million portfolio, but every dollar that we give to the work of God is an eternal investment in sharing life and hope. And as it's multiplied, as we're told, a thousandfold. Giving is the ultimate sign that we trust God. Giving is the opportunity to impact the world. And thirdly, giving is the ultimate pathway to joy. 
every hard teaching of God is a blessing for those who believe and obey. When Jesus taught, this is a hard teaching, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Such a contradiction, isn't it? By losing our life for Christ, we find it. In Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus was teaching us how to live in faith rather than fear. Fear tells us that there may not be enough to go around. Fear tells us we may not have enough when we turn 92 years old. Fear tells us we may not have enough even today. Fear is a voice in our heads that says, I'll start giving to God's work once I get a new job, once I get a raise, once I pay off my car, once I pay off my house, once I pay off the debt for college for my children. But joy and peace is only found in following Christ and allowing our priorities to do the will of God. If we keep putting off God first, it will never happen. Johnny Jennings was 18 years old. He visited a children's home on a church visit there with his 18-year-old teenager, walked onto the grounds. Three boys ran up to him and begged him to adopt them. Well, Johnny Jennings was only 18 years old. He knew that was not a possibility to start a family like that. But he knew God in those three boys was calling him. This was a sign from God. He took it that way, that he could do something to help. And there were those who needed help. 18 years of age, he decided to do something that he could manage. He began collecting money to get to that children's home. But he didn't make much money as an 18-year-old. So what did he do? He started gathering paper and aluminum for recycling, then gave the recycling money to support the orphans at the home. You know, when I was in youth group here and in Sunday school, we had what we called paper drives, where we would go out to the country in a pickup truck or whatever, and our people would bring the paper to us and we would sell that paper. We would also, at times, collect aluminum cans, which was a very significant source of income, and we would give that money to the missions. So we did that right here in Zion Church in Addyville and in so many other places. We had these paper drives, and because of the simplicity and soundness of his actions, at the age of 85, Jennings was honored for giving more than $400,000 to the Georgia Baptist Children's Home through his recycling work. Newspapers and aluminum, $400,000. When asked why he dedicated his life to this mission, Jennings says these words, the meaning of life is to find your gift, the purpose of life is to give your gift away. I just find that when I read that this week to be rather profound, not rather profound, but to be very true and profound. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give your gift away. A gift not given is not a gift. It just is mine, so I think until the day my eyelids close for the final time. It ain't mine anymore. We take nothing with us because all is God's. Trust. Experience joy in life. Giving, impacting the world. And then returning joy for what we do. This is prioritizing our resources. This is what it means to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, render unto God the things that are God's, and all is God's. 
the words of Jesus, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.